Hey guys, happy book club Friday, uh, my favorite day of the week. And uh, this week we read an incredible book and it was a first time for me as well. Um, so I'm so excited to be talking about it and experiencing it with all of you guys. So we read Trick Mirror, Reflections on Self-Delusion by Gia Tolentino. And let me tell you, whew, I just, I feel like I just did like 20 years of school and philosophy in the last week. Like Gia is so brilliant, such like a genius contemporary mind. Um, and it just kind of captures the essence of feminism and, and internet culture and kind of what feminism means today in this time of internet culture, um, just kind of how it all affects the way we interact with ourselves and with each other. Um, oh my gosh, I literally cannot say enough good things about this book. I've like pulled so many quotes. I think at the end of it, I had like a hundred quotes. I was like, okay, I need to kind of tone it down. Um, but she's gonna be with me in a minute to talk. So that's really exciting. Um, but first I wanted to like read a few quotes that I pulled and then I'll also kind of read a few with Gia and uh, kind of get her thoughts on those. So let's read a few quotes first. Um, so first of all, a trick mirror that carries the illusion of flawlessness. That's kind of like around the title. I think that's super interesting. Talks about the internet. Um, here's another really good one. It says the internet was dramatically increasing our ability to know about things while our ability to change things stayed the same or possibly shrank right in front of us. Um, I love that quote and I think it's so true. You know, like we can't claim ignorance anymore. And I always say that with everything that's going on, we all have access to everything. So we all know what's going on in the world all of the time, but it doesn't necessarily give us the power to do anything about it. And you can feel super helpless, especially reading all of the news and everything, feeling like you don't really know what you can do. Um, this is one about just being a woman that I thought was so beautifully written. She says, not all men have made women fearful, but yes, all women have experienced fear because of men. That's a super powerful quote. I think as a woman, I really can relate to that. I'm sure pretty much all of you can. Um, and I, just, I think a really good way to not generalize all men, but also really empathetic and like understanding of how it feels to be a woman sometimes. Um, here's another really go good one. She says, when you are a woman, the things you like get used against you, or alternatively, the things that get used against you have all been prefigured as things you should like. Sexual availability falls into this category. So does basic kindness and generosity. Wanting to look good, taking pleasure in trying to look good does too. Um, it's also like, yeah, I felt super understood by that quote as well because it's true, I feel like in media, um, and Gia talks about this a lot in the book, kind of how as a woman, you know, you'd never be reporting on a man and like have the first thing you say be about the way that he looks. But I do feel like that's very present now, especially in politics, things like that. Um, just commenting on, on a woman wanting to look good. And I don't think that that uh, makes her any less intelligent or powerful or, you know, like we, I don't understand why that tends to be something used against women. Um, and I think Gia kind of said that perfectly. Um, and here's another quote. It's very easy under conditions of artificial but continually escalating obligation to find yourself organizing your life around practices you find ridiculous and possibly indefensible. Women have known this intimately for a long time. Um, I think that really speaks on feeling a little bit trapped or getting caught in a routine that maybe when you take a step back, you kind of analyze it and realize maybe it's not exactly something that you can even defend or understand why you're doing it. Um, and I think now this time in quarantine is actually a really good moment for us to take a step back, think about our everyday rituals, you know, in the world, our jobs, what we're doing, and be able to analyze those things and kind of understand, you know, is this something that's making me happy? Is this something that I can defend? Um, is this something that I can be proud of? And we should really take advantage of this opportunity to self-reflect and, and kind of analyze our lives, think about things that are uh, making us happy or not happy. 
Um, I hope a lot of you guys read the book. If you haven't, I really, really think this is such a good one to read, especially right now. It's so prevalent. It's just... And I've, I've honestly not read much modern day philosophy. So reading something that felt, you know, like we can all relate to it, it's, it really was life changing. Um, but I would love to bring Gia on. So let's bring her on and hear it from the woman herself. All right, finding Gia momentarily. All right, Eve. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for being on here. This is the first time I have ever used Instagram Live. I've it's never even made an Instagram story. I'm so fucking old. <gasps> I feel honored. My first Instagram live was my first book club. So that also shows I'm like still figuring it out. I'm still figuring it out. Um, but it's, it's fun and it's interesting. And it's also terrifying because we're live. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for being on here. Thank you. For All right, we are we're back. Um, this is part of being live. We experienced some technical difficulties. Um, but let me try to bring Gia back on here. I think there was an issue with connection or something. Uh, but, you know, right as we're getting into the good stuff. <laughs> so let me see if I can bring Gia back on here. The internet is fun. It's fun. It's Hi, Gia. I don't know what happened. <laughs> this just shows how many of us know how to work Instagram Live. Um, but I was saying thank you for being on here and for getting ready. Like for me, once a week doing my hair is a really big deal. It I like I like I tweeted at you. I put on a real bra for the first time I, in thirty six days, <laughs> and I, I feel love that. it feels you know what it feels good to put on a bra again. It does day. feel good. I mean, my thing is I like get ready waist up. Other yeah. than that, like I'm in sweats. I'm not. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've I've got my I've got my slippers on right now. <laughs> oh my god, I've been living in slippers too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so Trick Mirror was your first book, right? Yeah. First book, how long did it take you to write it? It took me, I wanted to write it, I started writing it um, in the summer of 2017, finished it in 2018. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to write, I think I wrote it a little too fast. If I had, if I could go back, I would, I don't know, I, I didn't take any, I work at The New Yorker, I would have taken time off work to do it, but there was also- Oh my God, you, you, know, you wrote the book while having a full-time job? Yeah, there's something about, you know, I feel <laughs> I have this real like millennial, um, I graduated in the middle of the last recession. And I was just like, you know, I've been, I was always like, I have to, I have to work every, I mean, it's part mm -hmm. of this whole capitalist thing that I talk about in the book, this sense that if you're not producing, yeah. you know, if you're not working, I was always like, if I stop working for a single second, I'm going to lose my health insurance. And then like my whole life is going to crumble, you know, just, yeah. There, well, there's such just pr like a pressure now for everyone. I feel like, cause all you see are people being successful everywhere yeah. that millennials especially are like, if they take a day off, they feel like they're not doing anything with their lives. And there's something about all of like the way social media, even like Instagram itself. I mean, it, it turns living life into a form of work. Mm -hmm. There's a way in which um, all these systems are set up to, you know, increasingly monetize every last second of our, you know, it's like got a spare room, rent it on Airbnb, like mm -hmm. have 20 minutes, drive for Uber. Like there's, I fall prey to that mindset and I was trying to get out of it. But, um, but there was also, the book is kind of about like now it's about the culture we live in right now. And with a mm -hmm. book like that, I was sort of like, you might as well, you know, I wanted it to come out when it still felt kind of, plausibly relevant and not like absolutely about like five years before well no especially with social media things are changing constantly I feel like you know even two years ago three years ago things were very different so I feel like the fact that you captured the essence still of now is very impressive with how quickly things tend to move on on social media don't you feel like even February was another era I mean I feel like we've been in quarantine for years <laughs> even like a month like <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, just even like the different social media platforms that are kind of submerging out of this are so wild to me. I like, I feel like 
I'm behind of the times and I'm very much, you know, the generation that is social media. So. Yeah, you have to be telling me what's going, what's actually going on right now. <laughs> I have clearly no idea. Um, <laughs> so why did you choose essays rather than writing a whole book? Well, you know, I, I wanted to give, I feel like it's really important to give an idea the right amount of space. And with these mm -hmm. ideas, like each, each essay was kind of based around a question. Like the first essay is about the internet. And the question mm -hmm. was like, you know, 15 years ago, the internet seemed like it was only amazing and full of promise. And then suddenly now we all kind of know that the internet is rotting our brains a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was like, why did the internet go from being bad to good? Like each of the mm -hmm. essays was one question and and I was sort of like, these are questions that I could try to stretch. Like you could probably write a kind of bad book about each one of these questions. Yeah. But I wanted to, but I, I like the essay form. I like, I, I mostly, I got my start writing online. You know, most of us, we do a lot of reading online and this was the first time I'd ever, you know, in writing a book, I was like, okay, I want it to be a worthwhile object. I want it to be, I want these to be, I want it to have the sort of liveliness that we kind mm -hmm. of expect from the internet. But yeah, also like that the, constantly updating and changing. Our attention spans are so short now. I yeah, because my kind of... brain is trained on that too. But mm -hmm. with the thing that the thing that I love about books, right, is that you know when we stare at screens all day, when you're actually reading a book, it recalibrates your attention. You can really mm -hmm. focus on things in a way that I personally can't reading on a screen. No, and so no. I yeah, so I wanted to. And I like the essay form, you know, like I, I like it as a way of being like, I'm not even going to try to answer these questions, but I'm going to see how you could even try to answer the question. Like, I'm not going to present you with an answer, but I just, I like Like the way show your thought process kind of. Yeah, just you walk you through. Them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. And it feels super authentic as well. I think when you're reading it, I feel like I'm like answering the question along with you and kind of like understanding how you got to those conclusions. But you say this super interesting thing in the book about how in our lives, we kind of have like a backstage, you know, when something happens and then we all go collect somewhere with your friends to talk about it or you go home and how you say the internet doesn't have a backstage. And I found that so interesting because you're so right. Like there is nowhere to hide on the internet. Yeah, well, and I wonder how you feel about this as someone that's been in the public eye for a long time, you know, mm -hmm. like I, um, like, I think one thing that's interesting about the internet is that it, the, the sort of mechanisms that used to only surround celebrity, it sort of systematizes for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Like the idea that, you know, strangers could know about your life, that you could, you know, the de intimate details about you could be known to like an indefinitely increasing number of people mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that used to be a way of life that's really particular to like the ultra famous, but now, it's the like economic model of all these social media platforms. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, like it's, there's a thrill in that, but there's also a constriction, right? Like, absolutely. And, well, and it's like, like there's certain yeah. things you wouldn't do, you know, in front of an audience of a million people that suddenly yeah. the internet gives you like the bravery or, you know, I'm, I'm like awful at public speaking and I would never, but like suddenly when you're just talking to your phone in your room, it becomes, a little bit less scary um, and a little less yeah. intimidating. And I think that's like the internet almost gives you this false sense of security because it is very intimate, but then you think about actually the amount of people on the internet and it suddenly is a lot less intimate. Yeah, and it's and it's like, I think again, like there are parts of that that are, that are kind of amazing, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. I think the internet, the way it's made it so easy for anyone to communicate with anyone, it's meant that, you know, the last 10 years, all of a sudden, like there's been, like the the internet, the diversity of voices you hear on the internet and, you know, like suddenly we're hearing from people that you wouldn't have heard from before. Mm -hmm. But there's something, but the, like the thing about being able to speak to an indefinitely increasing audience at all times mm -hmm. is that like, you know, we're, we're in, in natural human life, you know, we're one way we're with, when we're with our boss, we're one way when we're, we're with our mom, like, mm -hmm. and with the internet, it's like, you have to be all things to, uh, like, you know, the incentive is that you should kind of be pleasing to anyone at any everyone. Time. And that's impossible. It's impossible. And I think that's like this, the, probably the most toxic part of the internet is like that idea of being able to please everyone, even everyone in a workspace, let alone, you know, the world is 
just impossible because it's like so subjective and then you're kind of putting yourself in this position of trying to do that and you also talk about how in life like you can just walk around and you're still visible you're being seen on the internet to be seen you have to act you have to do something and yeah. i think it gives people especially young people a lot of pressure to like do something crazy um just to get recognized or noticed you know rather because it's not enough to just be yeah and i think uh you know we're seeing in quarantine how much we miss how what it's like to be in each other's physical presence mm -hmm. and not need to take like to be seen in kind of the natural way right to be yeah. like to not need to to just yeah because like it's it's a natural thing to want to be seen and to want to be recognized but the internet it makes you actively perform to need to do it yeah but how do you feel about the whole i mean i'm genuinely curious like like having been in the public eye you mm -hmm. know since you were young like what that and you know there's no especially for young women that is the, the the kind of expectation that you'd be pleasing to whoever's looking at you at any moment how have you navigated that you know it's it's tough because in a lot of ways i think you know it's important to establish who you are outside of the internet Absolutely. and i'm very grateful because i think i was actually one of the last generations to be able to do that um like i didn't have instagram until i was 14. yeah um but I, again, I was like one of the first, I was probably the, like the, I call myself the test dummies for Instagram and things like that. Um, and I think I will say the really amazing thing is we have this ability to kind of tell your own story in a way that we didn't before, especially as a model, um, being able to have a platform to like share your voice and ask yourself the questions that maybe people aren't asking you. Yeah. I find to be really amazing. Um, you know, like... Yeah. I don't get asked about what I'm reading in interviews naturally. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, but I wanted, I want people to. And so I was like, yeah. you know what, I'm going to ask myself what I'm reading and you yeah, know, that's cool. whoever wants to hear can hear things like that. I just think being able to, when I realized I could control the narrative, um, I found a new appreciation for, I think what social media means to yeah. young women, especially. Yeah. I mean, for me, like it has definitely, I mean, I think that the sort of economic structure of the internet is kind of monstrous. I think it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a structure of surveillance and monetization that I find mm -hmm. you know, really destructive. At the same time, I definitely only have a career because of it. You mm -hmm. know, like, like for writers that don't come from, you know, like particularly connected or, you know, traditional backgrounds for, mm -hmm. you know, like it's it's been a reason that a lot of people who don't look like what you would expect from like a, you know, some like highbrow fucking magazine or whatever have been able, you know, I, I, I don't think I would have the, I certainly wouldn't have the job I have without the internet. So yeah. yeah. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that, um, yeah. like I would never bite the hand that feeds me. And I think like, yeah. there's no shame in, in giving a nod to the internet for what it's done for everyone. But I also yeah. think it's super important to also notice the places where it can be, you know, bad for yeah. us. And like, I think the pressure it puts on, on millennials to, you know feel like they're doing something incredible to you know live a life that's worth living i think that that can get super tricky because you know there's like you, you talk about in the book how people would like grow up and they wanted to be doctors and lawyers things like that suddenly like those aren't the answers we're getting from even six seven year old kids because they grow up with youtube and with instagram that'll be tiktok and, stars baby yeah <laughs> and like that's that's the new thing that people are like aspiring to be so i just think it shifts and like all these jobs you know like doctors right now it's so important um and i think sometimes instagram can kind of like because those might not always be the people being recognized on the internet it can kind of you know lead us astray and thinking about like stuff that actually matters yeah but well, i also think right now it's good for like yeah. things that are going on with COVID-19 because we are recognizing and giving those people, you know, the recognition that they deserve. Yeah. And like, I, I think uh, it's interesting of all of the things that this era is clarifying, you know, like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's uh, all of the things that it's highlighting. One kind of amazing thing about it is that, you know, yeah, the internet doesn't typically show the lives of like working class people or it, it doesn't typically or the media even right the mm -hmm. media is terrible at covering these things. But in the last month, like I think it's been really clear to all of us that like people who the internet has made it um, 
the internet has given us sort of a direct line to what it's like to be, you know, a Whole Foods worker who's like mm -hmm. not making enough money and getting screwed over, right? Or like, you know, someone in a hospital without enough PPE. There's the, the directness of that communication is really wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of giving, telling those people stories, giving them a platform. Yeah. Um, has the evolution of the internet kind of this idea um, of growing up as the internet also kind of expands and evolves, has that always been pretty, um, you know, important in the things that you were writing? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, as I think that the internet for better or worse, it is the biggest change of this era, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's changed every system. It's become this sort of central nervous system in our society through which everything, I mean, you write a story about politics, you write a story about health, you write a story about anything and it passes through the internet. And mm -hmm. there's, there's just this, um, this unavoidable centrality to it that seems um, like, it, you know, every story is in a way an internet story, mm -hmm. like no matter what. And there's also, I think I am just fundamentally really interested in the way that the internet takes all of these old natural social impulses, right? Like we were talking about to be to be liked by other people, which is a natural and like good impulse, I think, mm -hmm. to be seen, to be recognized as who we are, to express ourselves, whatever. It, it takes all of these behaviors and monetizes them. Mm -hmm. And I think like that is my fundamental interest in it. Like, what this what this ecosystem is like that suddenly monetizes every last inch of human life yeah. is fascinating to me. Yeah, and you and you bring up a really valid point in your book where you were like, the internet used to kind of reflect and talk about the things that were happening in our lives. And then you say now it's like the internet almost dictates then what happens in our lives. Yeah. And that's so right. And I think now more than ever it's like the internet plays such a big role in what's happening in the world you know, in even politics. And oh, yeah. I mean, the internet determined the last election. It will determine all of the elections to come. Like, it, so why, crazy. like it's little so Facebook crazy. policies on what is allowed and what is not is, like, hugely politically determinative. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I have a funny question. Do you remember your first ever screen name that you had? Oh, girl. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> Tell so us. I, think I was like, uh, so I think I was like, this is literally like, I was in third grade or something. And we had gotten like, AOL. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we'd put the little CD in and it would like, it was on dial up internet. I mean, the thing that's it's so funny that it's like, you know, I'm 12, 12 years older than you or something. And, and it feels like it just this massive, like, uh, like, well, that's what's wild. Even like, difference. I see, you know, 16 year olds and I'm only 18 but who know how to work TikTok in a way yeah. that I would never I just like throw my hands up to them and I yeah I call it grandpa totally. syndrome it's because like technology <laughs> changes so quickly that we're all like mm -hmm. in my day but it's like we're still like I know yeah like, but but it, yeah it was um it it actually it's fitting for this book club theme it was um books with a z 88 <laughs> that's not a bad one at all I, think that's pretty I don't know books with a z <laughs> I mean I don't you, know you never I had, did you have embarrassing screen names? You were, it, that was before. You no, know, I was super late also to be on social media because it terrified me. Like, I'm very grateful also that now there's like 10 year olds on Instagram. My 10 year old self was not, I'm very happy I was able to like grow up and mature before I kind of like got yeah. on social media. And still, you know, I was 15, 14, 15 when I got on Instagram finally. That was my first form of social media. And I still look back and I'm like, you know, this idea that you talk about in the book of having to constantly face who we were. There's like a permanent record of every moment of our life that just didn't exist before. And you cannot run from your past now. You just absolutely cannot. Well, and one thing that I think is interesting about that. Well, are your 14 year old Instagram still on your, uh, like, if I, I, think I, there are back, some. I think there are some. some. Yeah. <laughs> Although I have archived a few, I won't lie. <laughs> Yeah, you go back and you delete the ones with like really bad no. filters. Nope. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. you know, the collage is a funny story. Like I, um, so I actually, in 2010, I spent a year off the internet because I was in the Peace Corps. And so I was like in the middle of nowhere, in the mountains, no internet. Like in a lot of way, like quarantine has been, it's like, it's like this, but this is way chiller. Like all my Peace Corps friends are like, I can take a hot shower. I don't have to take a shit outside. Like this is great. <laughs> 
<laughs> like I have the internet, this is amazing. But I, I came back and Instagram had happened and I was like 22 and I was like, okay, like I thought that this was a private app where you could like add interesting filters. And so I like took a nude and put it on Instagram because I like thought it and was you didn't know. like just for me, you know, like I thought it was like just well, yeah. like, like cool filters. <laughs> and then I mean, we had been like in public for like a month and I was like, <laughs> and you had no idea. I had no idea. I mean, I don't like I no one followed me. I didn't follow anyone, but it was still like, oh my. Well, no, that's why the internet is so scary is even something like that, that might you know, carrying no significance in the moment <laughs> can come back and bite you in the ass. Later Thank God, on. I, want, I know. Well, it's, it's funny. I think one thing that the internet, like that aspect of it that you were just talking about that, like you could get on the internet when you're 14 and, mm -hmm. you know, presumably like sometimes when I'm on looking at Twitter, especially I'm like, are we going to be doing this till we die? <laughs> you know? I know. Well, I mean, the, the amount that social media has changed even from when I got on it, I just wonder where it can go or where where there's left to go. It seems like it's at such an extreme, but then it constantly is proving, you know, that there's, we can take it farther and farther. Right. Like, you know, in five years, there'll be like a massive venture capitalized, like, you know, subscription service that shows like two second videos. You know? I know. I'm also like, how could our, I mean, my attention span is pretty short. But, you know, even I have trouble keeping up. Like when Vine happened, it was like seven seconds, I think. Yeah. I was like, how do you fit something into seven seconds? Like okay, I But didn't... Vine was so good. Oh, Vine was so good. Vine, I was, Vine. Vine was the good one, yeah. I miss Vine. Vine. Was, like, I've got nothing bad to say about Vine. <laughs> Rest in peace to Vine. <laughs> But, but like, there's, there's this aspect too. So the internet rewards, like, I think it's important to pay attention to what the internet rewards and why. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the internet rewards is like, you know, like we were saying earlier, this, this sort of brand, you know, like the, this branded quality of being as appealing to as many people at any given time, which is mm -hmm. not like a natural thing for human personality to need to do. Mm -hmm. And that there's a way in which it encourages this almost demands this sort of consistency, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to, I think it, I think there's this, it can give people this subconscious feeling that if they, if they had an opinion, that's gotta be it, you know, like they can't change, they can't be wrong, they can't fuck yeah. up. And it's like, that's, that's completely antithetical to what it's like to be a human, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it used to also be, you know, if you did something stupid at a high school party, people at your high school might talk about it for a week and that was it. And now there's this immense pressure for kids, you know, even just applying to college where all of this stuff is completely accessible for everyone. And you no longer have the space, which I think is a really good thing in a lot of ways. It like kind of eliminates the amount of space you have to mess up, but it also can be scary. No, that's bad. You're naturally, well, you're naturally supposed to mess up when you're, especially young. Yeah. And I mean, suddenly yeah. you can't do that. Well, how have your, like... I mean, how do people, I, I truly always think this, like if, God, like if I had had, I mean, I had Facebook my senior, right after I graduated from high school, but, mm -hmm. you know, if I had had even just a smartphone in high school, like, it would have been dark. <laughs> like, yeah. No, I mean, I was always so paranoid because I realized, like, my biggest thing was I always wanted to go to Columbia when I was younger. Like, that was just my dream. I haven't gone yet, but who's to say? Yeah. Um, but I just... Even, at, you know, you'd be at a high school party or whatever. I was always so careful. Yeah. And it kind of, like, implants this sort of awareness in your head, you know, of a phone. Because, you know, you don't need to see a camera now to have a picture taken of you. Right. Um, and that's true for everyone. It doesn't mean, like, you don't even have to be in the public eye to be messed up by something like that. Or, right. have, you know, interfere with your life. And I think kids now are just always aware of phones and cameras yeah. being on them at all times. But, but there's one thing, like, I feel like people your age, like you guys, you know, you pioneered like the Finsta, like mm -hmm. there's something like the, I think the people my age, I think um, there's this, like we've had to learn in like, as we were adults that the internet has all of these, kind of conflicting and often bad mm -hmm. incentives working on us. But, but I feel like, you know, people who are more native to it, you're like, yeah, like you need, like, like, like that's what the Finsta is. It's the backstage yeah. stage basically. I think for, for sort of like the second generation of people going into social media, like I think at first it was very exciting and people were seeking that kind of public attention. And I almost feel like 
then you know the second round of people that kind of got into social media at least um i can speak for myself were almost seeking that privacy yeah um and it is interesting the way social media can kind of in a lot of ways you know it makes people want attention um but in a lot of other ways it makes you really appreciate the private moments and the quiet time at least you know for me yeah. and or for yourself like you start to appreciate the times when you're not being monitored and not everything you say is you know being seen by lots of people um and you say something super interesting in your book just about being a woman in the media and um i mean that whole essay is just so genius to me but i think when you talk about like the fact that women are able to be flawed now in the media so that hopefully then someone else can see that woman and and say okay so it's okay for me to have issues too um, and I think that's so important because that sort of pressure to be especially a woman in the media and not only do you have to say and, and do the right thing, but you also have to dress right and look right. And I mean, there's all these pressures that men I don't think have in media now um, for a woman, even, you know, an author, a politician, whatever, to oh, absolutely. a certain way online. Oh, yeah. Like the amount of scrutiny that like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gets on every single move she ever makes. And it's like, please. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 when it became okay, and I think I mean it was always okay, but now it's just in a much larger scale to comment on a woman's appearance when you're talking about something that should have nothing to do with the shirt that she's wearing or her makeup. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where social media really comes in because suddenly it really tends to like dilute the actual conversation and focus on you know what her hair looks like. Yeah. And that can be a really dangerous thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, and when, like, when you were growing up and with the age of social media, who were some of those women that were super, like, prevalent then that were kind of starting to, you know, you talk about, like, Gwyneth Paltrow and Winona Ryder, people like that. Um, who were the women that, like, kind of helped to navigate that for you? Well, you know, honestly, um, someone that I've been thinking about a lot recently. So one thing that I... I think one of the things that I've always been aware of since I was little was that life, and I think maybe this is why I'm so interested in internet mechanisms, is that I never really took the lives and the narratives that, that were being mapped onto celebrities. I was like, that can't, we can't, I'm not going to understand the world through what's happening to them because they're living mm -hmm. under these conditions that are not particular to normal life mm -hmm. necessarily, but now they are because of the internet. But I've been thinking about Fiona Apple a lot this week mm. because of her new album. Love. And, yeah. <laughs> Thank so God for Fiona Apple right now. Truly. It is so, so good. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny. It's like, I've been, I was thinking, I'm so grateful. I listened to her a lot when I was 11 years old. I listened mm -hmm. to her when I was 25. I'm still listening to her. It's, it's amazing. But I think, um, you know, honestly, like, there was nothing more formative maybe than like being high being in high school during the early, like the early 2000s, like the real sort of tabloid, you know, like Britney Spears upskirt, mm -hmm. like era and, and being like, this is like, this is a nightmare. <laughs> this is yeah. a nightmare out here. Terrifying. You know, like, like the whole like, late 90s, like teen stars getting hot, you know, the, the sort of really mm -hmm. um, bland, uh kind of like Paris Hilton era of of tabloid celebrity it was mm -hmm. it was it was a lot for me but I think like I mean but one of the things that I was thinking about with that like I, you got a flip side to it too right like that's another mm -hmm. thing in that essay where you know there's so much shit that we need to defend women against that mm -hmm. you know it then becomes possible to be like anything a woman does it's like you know, we shouldn't criticize her. She's just a mm -hmm. strong woman. Yeah. Which has, you know, been applied to like Elizabeth Holmes and like the, you know, like Melania Trump, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I remember. Where it's like any, any criticism of a woman can be turned into being anti-feminist. Yeah. And, like and, that. and that's a real defense mechanism where it shouldn't be, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I always remember like when Melania Trump was wearing that, um, you know, like that, I really don't care, do you jacket mm -hmm. when she was like going to visit the kids at the border and they were, mm -hmm. and the White House was like, you shouldn't talk about a woman's appearance. Like that's not, you know, and I was like, uh-huh, you know? Exactly, well, no, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, I think, especially with yeah. feminism because we want to hold ourselves to these standards. We want to be, but then suddenly if 
if somebody does criticize you, you can be like, well, that's very anti-feminist of you. And um, yeah, and, and that's yeah. something that I feel like it's really important to guard yourself against. Like, it's like, I think that to me, a, you know, one of the most important things about feminism is that if you treat, if, if like, if this is the belief that people are equal, you know, and that women deserve respect, then, you know, if you mm -hmm. respect someone, you treat them like a person and their decisions are up for criticism when they should be. Absolutely. You know, and, and for so, the right reasons. For the right reasons, yeah. 100%. And yeah. you talk a lot about kind of the idea of web addiction. Do you think people feel it more or less now, this sort of like obsession with the internet? Like during coronavirus? Yeah. I don't know about you. Have you, like, I've, you I've gone into like, so many screen. internet holes. I like, <laughs> I can only speak for myself when I say I've discovered new areas of the internet I did not even know existed. <laughs> Same. I mean, you know, like that once a week thing where you get your screen time alert. Like, I'm, I'm like, please. I won't look. It's like it's gone up eight hundred percent in the last. Like, like oh. I'm gonna die. No, that's why I was so grateful to read your book because it gave me time away from being on my phone. And I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person. I think this is like a very millennial thing of like, if I'm watching TV, I'm on my phone too. Yeah, so books are so great for me because it that's forces the only me thing. to focus on one thing. That's the only thing. Yeah, like to me, it's like. It's the only, I'm like, yeah, it's, I, like, I'll check my email if I'm reading, if I'm, mm -hmm. like, watching TV. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's awful. I think, um, I think that, well, so the internet, you know, it's designed to make us addicted to it, right? Like, they, mm -hmm. like, social media companies, you know, Instagram included, they have, they have behavioral psychologists on staff to like the, the way they can make money is to increase engagement. The way they can increase engagement is to get people sort of cognitively addicted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it's really like, I mean, we can certainly change the way we interact with these systems, but in a lot of ways, like, I think it's good to just recognize that, you know, that, that thing where you can't think about anything and you just keep like looking for something new on your phone. Like that's exactly. Yeah, I mean, that endless like refreshing of the Instagram feed and, um, and, and the thing I think that's crazy about the internet is there is an endless supply of new things to discover. So and if they're you're always looking, will there always yeah. will be, there always will be. And, um, it's like, how do we determine when to cut ourselves off or when to say, this is it, because you're never going to run out, you know, a book, it ends and that's it. And you put it down, but the internet doesn't work like that. Yeah. I mean, one thing like right now I am more grateful for the internet than usual because mm -hmm. it's the only way we have to be with each other. Right. Like, absolutely. you know, like FaceTiming my goddamn friends, <laughs> like, you know, it's the only, I know. um, and I have like, you know, there I don't know if you felt this, but the internet, like a lot of the really bullshitty behaviors that the internet inc like encourages, they're kind of being exposed as bullshitty behaviors, mm -hmm. you know, like. Um, it's like reshifted our focus. I think the past month, I, I feel like, at least from what I've seen, people are really starting to show humanity on the internet, which is amazing. Yeah, and people and are like really supporting to. each other. Yeah, and like, and like for me, like I've been watching a lot of like wildlife cam videos. Like I was watching a a bison cam video in Yellowstone National Park today. Oh. Like I've been, um, yeah, I've been trying to, like my internet has gotten a little more. I don't know, but at the same time, I'm just like also refreshing like death totals in New York City every second. So Which I don't is, know. But... Also, yeah, you need to take a break. I think from the news. Yeah. Like I I limit my news time to like 20 minutes in the mornings and yeah. then I'm like, okay, that has to be it because. I do that with social media. I have, um, I have blocker, I have like apps on my phone and on my computer to keep me from, because otherwise like I'm, I have no willpower. Like I just keep no. like, you know. I mean, it, it truly is an addiction and it's so yeah. that way. <laughs> I have to ask you about your experience being on a teen reality show. <laughs> Cause I loved reading that. Honestly, probably that was one of my favorites. Just how honest it was and like your experience doing that I just want to know like how that was for you well it was honestly so tight like <laughs> <laughs> it sounded so fun truly yeah because like. it was like you know okay so like I'm in I'm 16 I'm in Texas I like was dying to get out of Texas at this point like all I wanted I had gone to this super tiny like super Christian super conservative school for my whole this oh shit 
Oh, are you back? back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, I don't want to miss it. <laughs> and it was like suddenly, I mean, I don't know if this is what like modeling gigs felt like to you, but it was like, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly just to get to be on your own and get mm -hmm. to do, and to like, even just like be just, yeah, to be like just totally free for a month. Like I, I was like, oh, I get to skip school and like go yeah. be on an island and do these stupid, stupid challenges. And it was the, honestly the most fun part of it for me was that the camera people were also camera people for the real world, which was, um, I watched it all the time back wow. then. And so I was just like, tell me, you know? Like, yeah, you're like, like, tell me everything. Tell me everything, you know? Well, there's also it's, such this obsession of like the behind the scenes of everything now. It's so much more interesting. Well, yeah, you're like, tell me what's real, what's not. And so you, I think, explaining your experience on that and like what actually happened was so, so interesting. And I also, I feel really lucky because I got to be on a really gentle one. Like, I think I could have mm -hmm. been on a, like a, a real, like a reality TV show where it was, you know, where it was exploitative or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. but I just got to drink pina coladas and like, you know, play, play around on the beach and, you know, and it was, and I didn't get the, like, it was the sort of amazing thing also that I was like, I got to have done this, this incredibly stupid thing, but I, I never had to watch it. Like I didn't, I didn't watch it until last yeah. year. And, and it was, that's also amazing that you didn't watch it because now I think people are very like, even for me, if I shoot something, like I want to see it the second it comes out. And this idea of, you know, even people like Johnny Depp who, and Leonardo DiCaprio, people like that who could do shows when they were younger to get all this practice, get their, you know, thousand hours in without it being all over the internet. Um, you know, even people like, my mom who were shooting these things but it wasn't a constant flow of content from them and you could kind of like get your time and experience in without it being shown to the world at every step and so it's yeah cool you got the experience of having that without it you know being all over your friends instagrams a week yeah ago. and there were no camera phones and the footage wasn't even on youtube like it really underscored for me like how narrowly I had slid in under the wire mm -hmm. where like everything would be recorded and kind of permanent on the internet forever. I was like, Ooh, I escaped for like the last, you know, the last gasp of my high school life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I do think it's super important. You know, when I started working and traveling by myself, there's just certain things that, you know, no matter how much your parents tell you, you have to learn certain things on your own, this like sense of independence. Um, and suddenly when you have to do something, you gain the ability to do it. Um, yeah. And that's what I learned just from traveling by myself. Like there were things I didn't know how to do, but suddenly when you have to do them, you just like realize how strong and, and capable you actually are. I think that's like so important about traveling yeah. when you're young. Yeah, for sure. Experiences. Um, there is a really good quote I wanted to read about, um, here it is. There is no good answer to being a woman, the Art Mainstead lie and how we refuse the question. Um, I love that. I love that whole kind of essay about difficult women and how the fact that you can't really be free and good in history as a woman yeah, uh, is super true. Where did that kind of come from? Like the idea that you couldn't necessarily be free and have fun and be your own person and also be deemed good by society? Well, I think so. We're, you know, we are, we're so lucky to be women right now. I mean, it, it's always... Like, I think all the time about how, you know, women weren't guaranteed the right to get credit cards by themselves until the 1979 Credit Act. Like When I read that, I was shocked because to me, it seems so far removed that a woman didn't have that power. Yeah, I mean, like, spousal rape was legal in so many states, you know, until the 90s. Like, like the, the entirety of human history, everything that I've ever wanted to do with my life, such as, you know, be able to be financially independent, to be able to have sex when I wanted to, to be, to be able to not get pregnant, you know, if I didn't want to, right? Like yeah, all the things that we take for granted now, I think. They're, they were not accessible to most women for the vast majority of human history. Absolutely. And, and so that's why like the whole body of classical literature is full of women who become adults. And then all of a sudden there's this expectation that, you know, you are secondary, you know, you're literally, I mean, marriage, like the, the legal doctrine of it was that you and your person and everything you owned were 
owned by your husband. Yeah. Like this was the historical doctrine, right? All your land and, which belonged to your husband. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and I think, you know, there's, that's not freedom. And there was, mm -hmm. and, but that was what goodness looked like, right? Like being mm -hmm. sort of secondary to your male protector. Yeah. And, um, and one thing I think about is like, I often wonder, I mean, it's, it's something that's really important to me to think about all of the work that women and feminists have done for so long and to, and all the freedoms that they've given me that they didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30, yeah. let alone a hundred and to do as much as I can with them. Right. Like it's mm -hmm. like, um, and so the idea of refusing the question is really important to me. Like I, you know, um, like it's like, I don't have to, I don't have to get married if I don't want to, right? Like I am yeah. pregnant right now. I can give this kid my last name, you know, mm -hmm. like things like, I'm not going to answer the question. Like, you know, the idea that someone could ask like, why, you know, why wouldn't you just do the traditional thing or whatever? Like, you don't have to answer that question. Yeah. You don't have to, there are so many questions that we have the freedom of not even having, we could answer them if we wanted to, but we don't have to, we can live our own lives. We can Absolutely. make our own money. We can do what we want. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I think it's also interesting when you talk about not wanting to get married and how, you know, you'd go to weddings and that was, everyone would ask you, like, when are you going to get married? Why don't you want to get married? And, you know, that your boyfriend wasn't getting these questions. Yeah. Um, interesting it's how so they mad. ask how they're like, for you, it's so insane that you would, you know, kind of refuse this traditional act of getting married. But when it comes to him, people aren't really begging the same question. Yeah, there's this way that the wedding has so long been like historically framed for women as like, mm -hmm. you know, this is the best day of your life. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and I think it's because like, you know, it's really historically the one day where a woman can ask for everything she wants and everyone's like good with it. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest of her life, people are like, mm, you know, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> right. And, and to me, I was always like that. And, and I think Another thing that's in the book a lot, another thing that I always think about is the difference between the representation of something and the thing itself, right? Mm -hmm. Like the representation of a good life on the internet is whatever. Honestly, sometimes it sucks. Yeah. A good life itself is really important, right? Mm -hmm. Like the representation of happiness is whatever, but happiness itself is important. And mm -hmm. to me, the distance between a wedding and a marriage, right? Mm -hmm. The representation of commitment and actual commitment those two things seemed so like distant to me, like to be almost yeah. disconnected. And I was just like, what? Like, <laughs> Yeah, like why, why does that have to be the thing that deems, you know, your relationship committed? Yeah, and, and, also just, and it's just like, it's, they're out of control. Like I've got yeah. 50 of them, like what the fuck? So I, and I love that you brought up, cause you're talking about these like, you know, people um, getting married and sort of the wedding becoming a bit less traditional. And you actually mentioned my mom, who I always thought had like the best wedding. My parents like didn't wear oh, shoes. Oh, I did. That's right. Yes, yeah, so my parents yeah. did not wear shoes. Dress. My mom was in like a little slip dress. Um, great dress. Great dress. She still has great it. Dress. I'm going to yeah. steal it one day. Oh, um, yeah. But, you know, I also think that kind of like marked sort of a beginning where you could show your sexuality and you know be kind of like this sex symbol and have it still be deemed feminism whereas yeah. in the past those two things didn't go hand in hand and yeah. I think like in the 90s it started to be sort of um people were opening up to that idea of of that not making you less of a feminist just because you wanted to you know be sexy or totally against tradition and, all, and there's so many ways in which like I you know, I rag on weddings just because I have spent, you know, so much of my life yeah. going to them. But the amount of weddings that you say you've gone to, it's like exhausting. It's, but you know, weddings are fun though, I will say. But they're fun. Like, like right now I was like, me and all my friends are like, damn, like all these weddings, like all of my, so many of my friends' weddings have gotten canceled in the last, mm -hmm. like, and all of a sudden I'm like, damn, I wish I could get. I kind of want to do the together. electric slide right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I wish I was around, you know, like, yeah, like I wish I was around all of my friends getting hammered right now in like a formal dress. Like, <laughs> like, like it is, and it is nice that a lot of the things that like the super traditional kind of, you know, the like a lot of my friends have been walked down the aisle by both of their parents, right? Or they've walked mm -hmm. themselves down the aisle, or they, yeah, or with they don't their, take the, yeah, the bouquet toss or whatever, and everyone's like, ah, me next, you know. <laughs> Which I love, by the way. I think that's one of the funniest wedding. It's so funny. 
Where it's yeah. like a catch and you're like, oh, and it was like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. I found that to be like in, in movies, whenever that happened, I always found like the fight for the bouquet yeah, yeah, to yeah. be the most entertaining part of every wedding. Yeah. But I mean, no, the idea that also like all these weddings are being canceled now and, and like Zoom meetings, Ugh. things like that for me, I feel, it makes me feel old. And I know that I should be the one who knows how to do all of these things, but like relearning how to function in life like I think that's why reading this book was so wonderful to me because it was written at a time when the world wasn't like this and so it's like <laughs> a refreshing way to be like all right the world will go back to this one day and, and we do have a world that functions it might not be perfect but um you know in a in a way that hopefully we can all get back to someday yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I know I keep being like all I want to do is go out dancing and then I keep being like wait will I be like scared <laughs> well no and, and you wonder like when am i gonna hug people again i think it's gonna be a long time and i think I we're gonna all have to kind of relearn these fundamental things that we built our beliefs off of yeah. um and you talk a lot about self-expression um what the internet has become and like how it's kind of morphed into this popularity contest a bit um and there's a quote that you say you say where we had once been free to be ourselves on live online we we're now chained to ourselves online and this made us self-conscious. Um, I think this idea of kind of like the persona that you create online, suddenly you feel like trapped by, because again, like you said earlier, you can't go back on things that you said because there's a permanent record of them now and you have to kind of like really stick by your beliefs now. Um, have you felt like, you know, being a part of social media for so long that you feel like the persona that you've created do you ever feel a little bit chained to or tied to? I th the, the answer is no, but it's because I think about this stuff so much, you mm -hmm. know? I think like one of the, maybe one of the reasons I write about this stuff is so that I can make sure that my relationship to this thing that we're all gonna be tied to, you know, possibly forever is kind of as, as healthy a one as it can be. Absolutely. You know, like I think um, to me, one of the things I always just think about is like, it, there, there are two things that I always remind myself of. Like, I care a lot about what my friends think about me, you know, mm -hmm. and what my, like, coworkers think about people me. People know you. Know yeah, but, yeah. Like, but strangers, I don't give a shit, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> and, That's so important, by the way. Yeah, and, and it's like, because I've, like, I try to remember that, like, people who I don't know, their opinion of me is not really my business, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's not actually really my business, and I, yeah, you know. And there's also, to me, it's like, the way you, to me, the way that you stay free. I mean, I have like gotten overwhelmed with this. You, like the period of like book self-promotion was very dizzying for me. Like I was at a book club and doing a Q and A and a girl asked me, she was like, so what would be your strategies for other people who want to um, cultivate a relatable personal brand? And I was like, <laughs> like, 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 been like how do I, tell me exactly what to do to be authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they said authentic, not relatable. And I was just like, I have to die now. But I yeah. think like, for me, it's like, as real life, real life is, is always like real life is the important thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like embodied presence is the most important thing. Like the, like the internet can never be more important than your actual life. Mm -hmm. You know, the representation of your life is so unimportant. Your actual life is really important, right? Yeah. And I think that, like, to me, that's so clear, you know, like, mm -hmm. actual life, actual relationships are so much more central that, like, whatever kind of, the version of me that exists on the internet, I do, I also want it to be not much better or worse than me. Yeah. But I want it to be kind of, a, like, like me, which is its own, like, fucked up desire, I think. But yeah. it's, like, the one that I have. But, but it's, like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, who cares? Absolutely. And, like, for <laughs> yeah. me someone who doesn't know me i i have to like stop myself from being offended whereas like if you meet me and have a conversation with me and then you leave and you're like yeah i don't like that girl i will be offended and i will be hurt. yeah <laughs> but if you just see my instagram or whatever and you decide you don't like me i try to not take that personally and i'm like that's yeah it's nothing to do with it it's just your like, business it doesn't matter yeah yeah and i also think now you know when we are stripped of most of our real lives and our human interaction and all we're left with is the internet it does i think it's showing at least me and a lot of us how important our real life is and like those human interactions, yeah. that human connection. 
Yeah, and it shows the way it's like the internet is always at best, it's like a shadow of, I mean, like I'm so thankful for things like FaceTime and for, you know, being mm -hmm. able to have conversations. It's like, it's, it's literally an emotional lifeline, but mm -hmm. as we all know, it is not a replacement from just actually sitting, sitting with somebody being with someone. and being with them. And, yeah. and I think, yeah, I think this has been a really, really clear reminder of that. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for being on here. This thank is like the coolest me. thing ever. I'm truly like I tell everyone the only people I fangirl in front of are writers and authors because I admire it so much because the idea <laughs> of sitting down and writing an entire book is so intimidating to me, but I will read all of them. So if you ever write anything else, please, please send it to me. <laughs> well, thank you for doing Quarantine Book Club. I'm excited to see what you pick. Always, up. always. Thank yeah. you so much. Bye. Enjoy. All right, guys. Oh, that was such a great conversation. Um, if you haven't read Gia's book, please, please read it. I found myself audibly stopping and saying things to myself like, wow, oh, that was so true. Um, she's truly so smart and so cool to read something, um, you know, a sort of philosophy that's super modern. Um, people actually say, I pulled a quote that people talk about Julie. They say she's one of the only writers right now who can incorporate meme speak into her prose without losing face. Um, and it's a, it's very much so a sign of the times. Uh, and it's a really big compliment, I think, for someone to get. And she deserves all of the praise. Please read Chick Muir. Um, and I will announce the book for next week very soon, which I'm very excited about because it's another book I haven't read. So we're really... Um, doing this all together. I hope everyone has a really good rest of their Friday, uh, wherever they are in the world. And thanks for tuning in again. Bye guys.